Hello, 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 and welcome. My name is Rihanna Ebanks Bab, and you are tapped in to Black Mental Health Matters. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I don't know what time of day or night you're watching this, but if it's good morning, good morning. If it's good afternoon, good afternoon. And if it's good night, good night. So I am joined by three very special guests today, and we're going to be discussing the psychosocial impacts and influences on Black men's mental health, specifically Black Caribbean men, Black African men, and Black African American men. And we'll be joined by three guests. One, Martin two, Dr. Corey, and three, Dennis. We will be discussing the perspectives of each of these Black men and what they feel and think influences Black men's mental health. So without further ado, I will bring on Martin. Martin, welcome to the Black Mental Health Matters platform. Thank you for joining me. How are you doing today? Um, very well, thank you. Uh, it's morning where I am, uh, so good morning to you. Yes, wonderful. And you say sunny where you are. Please tell our guests exactly where you are because it's a very exciting to have our very first person from this country here. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, so I'm joining you uh, live from Sydney, Australia. Uh, we usually call ourselves as the continent down under. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Lovely, lovely. And Martin, please tell the guests a little bit about yourself before I bring on the other two gentlemen. All right. Uh, so Martin Bakundana is my name, and I'm a chartered accountant by training uh, and by profession. Um, but uh, I am a mental health advocate uh, by passion. I've yes. been doing mental health advocacy for the last nearly <clears throat> three years, uh, but I've been... Uh, practicing as a finance uh, and accountant for nearly 15 years. So mm. th that's, that's a bit about me. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. And we'll get into the discussion about how you got into advocacy throughout the show. Thank you very much, Absolutely. Martin. <laughs> Next, we have Dr. Corey joining us on the stage. Welcome, Dr. Corey. Welcome to Black Mental Health Matters Platform. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you. And please introduce yourself to the get the sh the guests, I guess, and uh, uh, the audience. <laughs> Let them know where you are. <laughs> Most definitely. Um, my name is Corey Jones. I am in the United States of America, currently residing in the state of Arizona. It is afternoon here. It's about 1.30 p.m. And it is 115 degrees. So I believe that is 44 Celsius, um, depending yeah. on where you are. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of warm weather. It's bright and sunny, though. I am yes. a school psychologist by profession. Um, I became a school psychologist about eight years ago. And I also teach court-mandated classes um, from domestic violence to substance abuse to anger management courses. Yes, wonderful. Wonderful to have you here, Dr. Corey. Thank you very much. Um, and we'll definitely also be discussing a bit more about your profession and passions as well. And last but not least, we have Dennis Basulwa just joining us now. Welcome, Dennis, to the Black Mental Health Matters platform. Yes. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, yeah, as... Um, Rihanna said, my name is Dennis, Dennis Basulua. Uh, I'm a personal trainer by trade, uh, been in the fitness industry for 21 years now. Um, so I help people, yeah, body transformations and um, yeah, just not just changing their bodies, but um, helping them make those changes emotionally and mentally as well. I'm also a mentor for Manhood Academy Global, which is an organization uh, that mentors young black boys who don't have... Um, fathers in their lives or positive male role models you know and help them make that transition from boyhood to manhood um i'm based in london england um yeah and i've been a mentor with manhood academy global now for four years uh but throughout my life i've kind of mentored young people anyway through what i do working with uh, you know athletes mm -hmm. and uh you know people are like mm -hmm. lovely lovely yeah 
Thank you very much. This is going to be such a great discussion. I've actually been looking forward to it probably all mm -hmm. week, to be fair. Yes. <laughs> um, and yeah, very happy to have you all here and mm -hmm. discussing something that has been of great importance to all of us globally mm -hmm. and individually mm -hmm. um, as a Black community. So um, the topic of today is what are the psychosocial factors? that influence African, Caribbean, and African-American men. But before we jump into that discussion, I think it's very important for us as not only guests, but for the people that will be watching the show, what exactly are psychosocial factors understood to all of you, because you're all in different varying professions, but what does it mean mm -hmm. to you in your profession? Um, I'm gonna throw this out first to Dr. Corey. Okay, absolutely. Well, for me, psychos, um, social factors are, um, is, is actually, it's a mixture of things, right? From social media influences, from what we see on TV to what our peers, to what are, are, are the people, are our advocates, what, what society says is the norm, you know? And when I say the norm is, uh, and I know we're going not to be long winded, but you know, you watch a movie and or you watch a TV show for a young man and you see all of the superheroes and they all look a certain way. Right. And it kind of conditions your mind to think that that's how I want to look. If I want to be powerful, if I want to be masked, if I want to be all of these things, mm -hmm. that's the image I should be. Mm -hmm. So that's what it means to me. Thank you. Very powerful. Very, very powerful. Thank you for that. Um, next, Martin, to you. What do psychosocial factors mean to you in your profession? Um, uh, thank you, Rihanna. And uh, from my experience, from my um, uh, background, uh, so essentially psychosocial factors are uh, like the environment, you know, where uh, you, know, you, you, you grow up. Uh, so I'm originally from Uganda. Uh, and as a Ugandan, um, there are a number of um, cultural factors, a number of social factors yes. that have shaped uh, who I am today, how I see the world, how I uh, vision um, the, the, the world as a, as a man, as a father, as a husband. And that definitely um, influences a lot of how I perceive uh, certain things around me. Um, moving uh, down to Sydney in Australia, certainly the perspective has changed it because mm. again the environment is different um you, you know you're in this multicultural community and so uh how you perceive certain things around uh relationships around um uh, uh the, the networks that you have is certainly different so those are some of the factors that i, I would i would i would uh, i would consider as important uh, mm. in this particular aspect yeah mm. Mm, I agree. I agree. I agree. Thank you very much for that. And uh, Dennis, we've lost your visual, but um, oh, it's back now. Yeah, it's <laughs> Wonderful. Back, back. Yeah, yeah. I was just changing. <laughs> I was just changing settings. Uh, sorry, it's a little bit dark in the background, but uh, I was changing somewhere where I had a better signal. Okay, that's and, fine. That's yeah. fine. We need to make sure we don't drop out. We need all this good richness. So, one hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent. So we're talking about psychosocial matters. Uh, first of all, uh, Martin. Yes, I'm. I'm from Uganda as well. So, uh, uh. You know, yes. Yeah, so I was born in Uganda and lived there till I was twelve years old, and then moved to the UK. So, uh, yeah. So when we talk about psychosocial, you know, you know, issues that affect black men um just like uh, a little bit of what martin mentioned on your environment you know how you're socialized um mm -hmm. as a uh, as a black man and um obviously the um the psychology behind that as well um being born in africa i spent the first five years of my life in an african village and then moved to the city so that mm -hmm. so the um the social setting in the village was completely different you know, and then moving to the city, there was a different social setting. And then have, moving over to the United Kingdom, you know, a completely different social setting, moving to another culture where, as a black man, I was in a minority, you know, learning how to kind of navigate uh, that environment, how to adapt to that environment as well. So there's a lot of things, you know, um, you know, taking on different cultures, which kind of highlights the difference between how you perceive you know, life in general and your, 
you know, your opinions, your morals, your values versus mm. the morals, opinions and values of this new culture that you're coming into, you know, that mm. you need to either integrate into or assimilate. And um, yeah, so that's kind of how I see it. And uh, as a black man, um, having to, it's navigating, having to navigate all these different kind of social terrains, you know, um, yeah, and these are the skills that we kind of work on at Manhood Academy with young black boys and teaching them how to to handle uh, themselves in different, you know, in in uh, different fitness. settings. Yeah, yeah. but most, but I think most importantly, it starts with uh, uh, we probably, which we're probably going to talk about is uh, yeah, your history and your knowledge of self. Mm, you know? Absolutely, shapes your identity, primarily, doesn't it? Primarily knowing who you are, so that way you can. Uh, um, you can um, situate yourself. You know how to situate yourself uh, within the environment that you, you know, you find yourself in. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, everyone, um, for your definition. So I'm going to read out a, uh, let's say, a dictionary definition <laughs> from the journals on geront gerontology. I hope I pronounced mm. that right. But it yeah. says a black men exhibits the highest mortality rate and the worst health profile compared to other racial ethnic groups of men. They also explain that the health and well-being of black men is produced from an extremely intertwined set of relationships between individual, behavioral, social, and structural factors that have been endured across a life course. So again, given the fact that we've got um, people here, all of you, all of us, in fact, mental young people, and we understand the importance that this has from a very, very early age. Um, it also moves on to say that the factors include historical dehumanization, oppression, violence against Black and African American people has evolved into present day racism, such as structural, institutional and individual and it cultivates a uniquely mistrustful and less affluent community experience. So, 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 uh, yeah. What's your thoughts on that definition so far? Because I feel like we've, we've kind of tied a lot of it into each other. Um, and I think the just to kind of give scope on the, the tail end of that as well, it speaks about um, the inadequate access to and the delivery of healthcare services, how black men are in the receiving end of high police brutality and the fetishization of this brutality in news media, um, the divisive political rhetoric coupled with the increasing rates of separation, incarceration of black men, that have a part to play. Poor educational outcomes, career prospects, identity politics. There's so much to this um, that also ties into the understanding of role and the building of masculinity, fatherhood, manhood, um, and also how that ties into women of color's experience and how we also tie into the potential perpetuation of these um, these factors as well so let's delve into this let's talk about it what are your thoughts on what i've read out to you so far um i will throw this out to dr corey okay my thoughts is and like you said it's a lot to tag to unravel kind of there mm -hmm. but and i always go back to um social for me just because we're in that era of social media being as as, as big as a juggernaut we probably have you know and um, when you really just look at the things that social media kind of produces for black men, right? It kind of teaches us. So for example, um, and I do think things are changing, but for example, you would look at an athlete, the type of black men that sometimes celebrate it in the movie, right? Mm -hmm. From, um, especially in America, you know, um, at one point in time, most black men were, they were either the pimp in the movie or the hustler or if they were a good man or a stand-up guy, then they'll come home. And, you know, in the community, they were a good stand-up guy, but they also will come home and be physically abusive to their wives, you know? Mm -hmm. So it shows, it just always paints a Black man in kind of a negative light. And as a child, when you watch those, or even as an adult, when you watch that, you know, we may not always realize it, but it definitely does something to, to our mental to see us on the screen mm -hmm. being, you know, painted in such a light. It definitely paints a picture. And then and with young ladies, 
it, it kind of paints a negative light for them too. Like, is this the type of person or this is what I want to really want to deal with? And then it goes back. It just goes back generations, I believe, in mm-hmm. of a of a plot or if not a I don't want to say a plot, but a, an an agenda. I would say mm. because I don't think some of these things are accidents. I don't think that mm-hmm. we're painted in this light by chance. I think that this was done purposely. Yeah, yeah. Hence, hence the structural aspects of it. Because mm-hmm. if the, the structures went there, then you know how would we continuously find these parallels across generations? So um, I agree with you, uh, Martin. Do you want to chime in on this mm-hmm. one? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's it's a loaded kind of uh, definition that you gave us uh, there. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, but I, I try to throw from, it all uh, in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll pick it up from uh, you know the individual uh, um, perspective, um, and that's what I want to kind of focus on because um, coming from a background where you know you 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 have, uh, for example, uh, challenges that you're dealing with as a community right mm. you have different individuals facing the same exact um difficult economic circumstances for example mm-hmm. but then how we navigate to those those challenges sometimes it depends on our own individual mindset mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I've, I've seen that and and so there is that aspect that as an individual um how you respond to the challenges in your community depends uh, and 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 in most cases influences how you perceive um uh, you know those uh, circumstances around you so whereas we may all face those difficult challenges how we appreciate those challenges and how we tackle them uh, determines whether we succeed mm. or we fail mm-hmm. so i have seen young men who give up because mm. they have faced insurmountable challenges I have also seen young men who succeed because they said, I cannot be defeated. Mm-hmm. And that, that's, a mind, that's a mindset issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, so whereas I agree that, yes, there are social um, aspects to this, I also agree that there are individual aspects to this. Um, I also believe there are family, um, like you know, genetic uh, explanations mm-hmm. to this. So yeah. yeah, so I come from a family, for example, uh, that has, um, uh, you know, first you know, like serious challenges, but we have overcome them over time. Uh, mm-hmm. And I will share more about that. Mm-hmm. And so, whereas there are communal challenges at the society level, but at individual level, I still strongly believe that you can change your own circumstances by tapping into the potential that you have as a person and then using the resources around around you these days we have a very important resource called networking right (laughs) Mm -hmm. tapping into those people around you uh you have uh dennis here who is a coach right tap into those opportunities around you and Mm -hmm. scale your opportunities rather Mm -hmm. than saying oh you know i have those difficult circumstances i can't deal with them Uh, that's my perspective on this Mm. that's interesting because i think whilst i i do agree um there is a lot of individual will and autonomy um, that needs to come from this. Um, The structures that have been put in place can somewhat diminish that mindset and that zeal to alleviate yourself from certain circumstances. But Dennis, what's your thoughts? Because again, as a mindset and transformation coach, I'm sure you come through this all the time, the mental barriers Mm -hmm. that people have to push through in order to become the best that they can be. What's your thoughts on on the definition, I guess, that I gave? Yeah, um, I guess my my thoughts on that are, um, just like I was saying before, um, uh, a lot of it, um, in what I do as a coach and a, uh, you know, body transformation coach is I try and understand, um, the individual's uh, unique problems and challenges as best as I can, mm-hmm. you know, try and get uh, an idea of their background. You know, where are you right now? You know, how did you get there? You know, where do you want to get to? And um, so for us as, you know, black people, as black men, it's, uh, it's understanding, um, 
getting a deeper understanding of exactly what what our current situation is mm-hmm. you know the better you understand the current your current situation you know that the 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 better you're able to find uh effective and long lasting solutions to that uh that situation or that problem you know mm-hmm. so i feel that um the effectiveness of a solution of the solutions to our problem is directly proportional to the depth of our understanding mm. of you know where we're at at the moment and um so it for me it had to um it's had a lot to do with um once again um studying my own history not just uh, individual and and uh family history but history as general as a people you know my history mm. as a uh, a ugandan my history as an east african my history as an african you know mm. and my history as a black man in the diaspora you know it's kind of going out different levels um mm. and then find out what mechanisms you know got us from where we were we once were to here you know if, mm. you know delving into history historically you know mm. as uh, black people we were you know kings and queens and rulers you know depending on how far back you want to go so it's like what what's happened between then and now you know and get it gaining as deep an understanding of that as possible you know so that's that's my quest right now that's that's the kind of journey that i'm on and every day i you know i'm i'm learning constantly like you said through networking you know you're yeah. and speaking mm-hmm. to different people and gaining and understanding and their stories um you're learning every day you know today i was speaking to uh, a gentleman at at my gym that's from mauritius Mm -hmm. uh indian mauritian guy and he you know and i was sharing certain things about him about how indians ended up in mauritius in the first place because he's he's indian you know Mm -hmm. you know um and uh like i said the psychosocial issues that you know have affected his life and his father's mm-hmm. life and this that and the other so uh and i pointed out certain things to him that kind of you know started to give him a, a better understanding of kind of how things were um yeah where you know how things were the way that they were mm-hmm. you know so um so yes <laughs> it was a loaded question but yeah in a in a nutshell <laughs> it's um yeah it's basically finding out the mechanisms that have got us to this point and why as well you know I, I came to England when I was 12 years old having lived in Africa for you know you know being born and lived uh, raised in Africa so uh, mm. I knew that I was coming to a foreign land mm. uh, I wasn't expecting to be received with open arms you mm. know so it's almost like when I faced certain prejudices and um, treatments <sighs> I wasn't really surprised. Uh, mm. I wouldn't be more surprised if I was facing those prejudices and treatments mm. back home where I call, you know, my motherland. You know, I would have mm. been more surprised then. Um, so, um, yes, but I can understand. Go on. I was just going to jump in and say, I guess that goes down to a lot of what you've all mentioned is the environment that you're in, the shift mm. in environment and um again you you mentioned about being quite early on in your age when you came over here um again what i mentioned before about us all understanding the benefit of supporting young people with their self-identity and that development from an early age and i'm going to bring in dr corey in this question here as well um how do you feel that the external impacts the internal and vice versa. Well, most definitely the external is huge for the internal. One of the things that I see most, um, not only with kids I work with, but kids that in my family and me growing up, it's, mm-hmm. it's almost like it's not cool to be smart. It's not mm-hmm. cool to be mm-hmm. positive. It's not cool to do the right thing, you know. And here in America, um, kids in, from preschool to the third grade, they can all read on um, on grade level, right? They're right where they're supposed to be. But then with, for some reason in the fourth grade, it changes, right? And mm-hmm. the fourth mm-hmm. grade is more of a, oh, you're a, you're a nerd, you're a dork, you're a teacher's pet, right? So it's almost <laughs> like we, we, we teach ourselves, you know, yeah. to, if you do this, you're not cool. Even um, me as a man, I'm originally mm-hmm. from Compton, California. Um, so even as a man, like, 
I've heard the, oh man, you you left the hood. You you know mm. you don't do this. You don't do that. You know it's almost like a negative for me to so, want to uplift out. my life. Yeah, you mm. sold out. You know <laughs> type of thing. You know and that. But I always make sure that I give back to my community that I'm from and the community that I currently live in. However, mm. it's still you know you hear these things. So it's definitely a thing. So then when you internalize things, you get to question it. But hell, I ha- I'm sorry, heck, am I doing the right thing? Am I not doing the right thing? Mm-hmm. Um, gr- I know for me growing up, there's a, a popular movie here in America. It's an old movie with Eddie Murphy called Beverly Hills Cop, right? <laughs> and, and Beverly Hills Cop, right? So I remember no, watching well. that kid. <laughs> and mm. I wanted to be a cop because of Axel Foley yeah. in my mind. Yeah. 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 Like it made me want to do that. <laughs> but internally, that's what I want. But how would that be received growing up in Compton, California? Yeah. Yeah. When I have yeah. cousins, friends, uncles who are yeah. who sell drugs or do that, it's almost like, what? Yeah. You want to be a cop? That's yeah. what they own you, you know? Yeah, they'll call you up over here. Hopo. So it definitely um, plays a part. Yeah, mm. no, I, I really, really agree. And I appreciate that. And, you know, when it comes down to having that type of influence, it really can shape the life trajectory that you have, whether it is positive in respect of, OK, I want to alleviate myself from my circumstances or negative mm. in in ways of leaning into those stereotypes and structures that have been set up for us. So, um, yeah. Martin. I'm going to ask you a little bit about um, what your thoughts are on how how the mind develops these types of associations. But um, from your perspective and the people that you've worked with, what do you see the barriers are um, within the, the settings that you're in and from the perspective of someone in Sydney? Yeah, uh, thank you, Rihanna, for that. And... Um... What I will say quickly about that uh, is that, uh, again, I, I think I will connect it to what we you know, mentioned earlier, the culture and, 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 and uh, um, yeah, the, the culture factors. Mm-hmm. So for example, um, in, my, in my culture, there is, there is this common saying that men don't cry. Mm. Now, men don't cry is is not necessarily a bad thing but what that does is that when a man experiences pain they keep it deep inside Mm. right they don't reach out for help Mm -hmm. and when you don't reach out for help then uh you you keep that all that pain deep inside you Mm. and by the time the pain comes out you don't know how it will come out Right, mm. it may manifest in different ways, and one of the ways in which that pain actually manifests is in the violence that we see, mm. but it's also in the high suicide rates that we see, right? Mm. So, for example, here in in, in Sydney, mm. um, some of the statistics that we have are that um, seventy five percent of the suicide cases that we we, we see are from men, uh, mm. as opposed to women. And the reason is because men don't express their emotions, mm-hmm. whereas women do. They reach out, they seek for help. Mm. Men want to be men. And because they want to be men, and that's how society has enabled them, that as a man, you don't cry. You don't you know, share your pain mm. publicly. Mm. Mm. That forces men to you know, keep all that deep within. And by the time it comes out, the only option they have is, I can't take it anymore, mm. I'm off. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah. so that's why personally I have decided to make it my life purpose to speak up. Yeah. And I'd put my my vulnerabilities out there so that one mm-hmm. other person can speak up and say, look, he has also come out and said he has faced this. Mm. So I can also speak up. And in yeah. that way, we can actually bring down this, you know, um, it's a big issue. Yeah, it's a big issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. You probably um, are aware because of, you know, post-COVID um, uh, effects that globally the numbers are skyrocketing. Mm-hmm. You know, people are committing suicide. Mm-hmm. Um, people are really dealing with a lot of stuff. And these are not just black men only. It's across, yeah. right? Uh, and so 
um, the reason why I think um, uh, this particular affects black men is because historically we have been raised to be strong. Mm-hmm. We have been raised to, you know, to be to be the defender, right? Mm-hmm. You, you have to defend your woman. You know, you're, you're out in the evening with your woman, and and, and if someone approaches her in, in in a not so nice way, you have to speak up. You have to take action, right? Yeah, that's how we've been raised, and so that, in my in my own perspective, has contributed significantly to yeah. the rising cases that we see. Uh, and then secondly, um, the system itself has been designed not to support men. Mm-hmm. Y- you, you probably Actually. realize that there are many women um, activist organizations, right? Defending mm-hmm. the rights of women to speak up and less organizations talking about the same for men. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so the boy yeah. child has been uh, boxed into a corner where they are not supposed to speak up. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, if you are on the street and you get harassed by a woman and you raise an alarm, probably not so many people are going to come to your rescue, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But when the same happens to the sister, you know whether it's true or not, there will be, you know, reaction, right? Yeah. And, and a lot of support. So, so that also I think is systemic. That uh, you know. Um, uh, the structures and establishments that, uh, and of course, it also is historical because women were marginalized initially. But now, with the increasing focus on on, on women, the men have been left um, behind. Left behind. Yeah. And so it's it's time to really say, um, you know, like like how it was with all, you know, the, the, the Black Lives Matter. It, mm. It's also time to say all lives matter. Right, so the men also need to be uh, supported Central. because they need they need this support. Um, that's that's my perspective on that, uh, Rihanna. Yeah, I totally agree that um, when it comes down to men needing to be central to the support, um, you know, there there is a lot of organisations and support out there for women. The it's more social acceptable for women to seek help than it is for men. Yeah. So, you know, one thing that rings true to me is this popular saying of "I am my brother's keeper," um, and Dennis, this one's for you. So, you know, when when we use this slogan within our black communities, and as you've mentioned, Martin, that you know, if you was to see a man, say, acting out on the street or being abused on the street, uh, people are less likely to go towards them and and maybe offer help because of maybe the potential threat or the stigma or whatever it might be. Dennis, um, how what does this mean in respect of the development of the brotherhood mindset and how can we support our fellow black men that are in need of support to kind of overcome this and alleviate these these difficulties? Yeah, um, just like you said, this is um, in at Manhood Academy. Um, our motto, there's four lines to our motto. You know, the first one is "I am my brother's keeper." Mm-hmm. The second one is "I am my sister's protector." Mm-hmm. Um, the third is "I am my community's provider," and the fourth one is uh, "We are our ancestors reincarnated." Now, uh, going back to being your brother's keeper. Um, it's like you just mentioned. Say, for example, if you saw uh, a brother on the ro- uh, on the streets, or a man kind of going through what might seem like a uh, a mental mental health episode, or you know, a lot of people will be reluctant to approach that man, you know, because of fear, you know, and um, but because of the fear that's being exhibited by people around him, that would cause that brother to maybe even that might cause a situation to escalate or for him to feel even more alienated and so on and so forth so i think um it's that fear um we have a fear of each other you know Mm. especially black men we have a fear of each other i remember growing up in in east london um even now like say you catch someone looking at you you know you catch a brother looking at you and they'll yeah, and there'd be this, it's almost got this battle of wills, like who's going to look away yeah. first or, and, yeah. and it was, it's crazy. And then you, you, yeah. you see guys say, what, what are you, 
what are you looking at? And <laughs> from nowhere, something that yeah. was nothing becomes something. Uh, yeah. But I developed this. Um, I de I developed this kind of trick where uh, if I, if my eyes, mine and another brother's eyes, lock, if we locked eyes or eyes met, I'd look mm. at him for two seconds and then I'd nod my head. You know, mm. absolutely. And it's crazy what you know the change suddenly. Absolutely. Yeah, their whole their whole energy would change. They'd be like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 exactly. No, it's, it's exactly. me trying to. Yeah, it's me trying to express like, yeah, your number one brother. I see you. Yeah, yeah. I see mm -hmm. you. I recognize you, and I'm on your side. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm I'm not your enemy. <laughs> yeah, it no helps lower the defense with kind eyes. It, it, there you go. Yeah. Right. So so black men are traumatized. Black people generally are traumatized, but black men are traumatized yeah. because we're we, we're afraid. Uh, we're afraid of each other. Um, we've been taught. Um, like Martin was uh, kind of pointing. Um, pointed out not to express and talk you know mm. you know black uh, you know men don't cry or big boys don't cry mm. and uh mm. in manhood academy it's, it's toxic masculinity you know that's toxic yeah, masculinity absolutely. that yeah, exactly that, that cause mm. yeah causes us not to express the pain and the challenges that we're going through which like you said uh will kind of lead lead to deeper consequences or lead to that manifesting itself in either violence you know mm -hmm. disease mental mm -hmm. health <laughs> a lot of mental health uh, one of my sayings is you know communication healed the nation you know mm. i'm a big talker you know i'm all about talking <laughs> you know and not just aimless talking but you know purposeful. speaking and yeah purposeful talking and active listening you know when you speak yeah. long enough and allow someone to speak long enough certain things will you know certain things will kind of come out that will give you an indication and an idea as to <clears throat> what their challenges are and just for someone to feel listened to, mm. you know, goes a long way towards healing, you know, yeah, uh, and helping them. So, um, yeah, so I'm a big, I'm a big believer in that. So, yeah, that's our first, uh, uh, the first motto is I am my brother's keeper. You know, just looking out for each other. You know, yeah. um, not just physically, but emotionally and mentally, yeah, um, spiritually. Uh, and the second one is I'm my sister's protector, uh, meaning mm. that um, you don't, you know, if she's a black woman. You know, she is my sister. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't matter whether we're biologically related or not. If I see a sister out there on the streets, she is my sister. I see, any, you know, anything happening or she's in trouble, you know, you know, as a black man, she's my sister, you know, and I'm going to, you know, and I'm going to st step up or I'm going to, you know, show, you know, show that support. Um, so Can I jump in there real quick? Because yes, I feel course. like... Yeah, go ahead. They, they, I'm again a thousand percent in agreement, but I just want to be a bit of a devil's advocate here because yeah, course, you yeah. mentioned mm -hmm. um, toxic masculinity. Now, mm -hmm. um, something that we don't really speak about is toxic femininity. Oh yeah, hundred percent. That feeds into um, the perspective ah, of what we're talking about now. So mm. I'm going to bring in Dr. Corey on this question because I know you do a lot yeah. of work around domestic violence mm. and anger management yeah. and how does that feed into today's discussion because I think it's very important that emotional regulation um, whether it's court mandated or not but it helps with understanding the pressures from both sides I guess um yeah talk to me talk to me yes um it's definitely an issue um I think honestly um I think we did the toxic masculinity and feminine in the feminine and in energy to ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So when I when you're younger, when we say big boys don't cry, who's telling us that? Our parents, mm -hmm. our mothers, mm -hmm. or hey, stop crying, acting like a little girl, you know, all mm -hmm. of those things. So you go yeah. so long with that mindset, then you become an adult, and then your spouse is asking for more emotion from you. Mm -hmm. Well, hell, hey, I got 20, 30 years of being told not to show emotion. Mm -hmm. Now you want me to I'm show trying to emotion. Flip it on the head. Yeah. <laughs> right. It happens. So and it's a like like what Martin was saying earlier as well with when we <laughs> hold and we bottle things in, you know, it's like taking a balloon and mm -hmm. every time something bothers we blow, we blow, yeah. we blow. Mm -hmm. So eventually mm -hmm. we never talk and get it out. That balloon explodes. Just, and that's yeah, what seems to happen. Um, a lot of the times when people are in my domestic violent courses, you see mm. someone explode. You see that um, no one is taught. And I know like you, everything is a, a first time for everyone, right? For the most part, if you're a first time spouse, a first time parent at some point, mm. but no one has a great, not no one, but very few seems these days to have a good example of being a spouse, being a partner, you know, mm. having a unionship. 
So when it comes to the toxic masculinity and our counterparts and our sisters, it's mm. almost like, um, so like Dennis, when you were saying, I'm my sister protector. Nowadays, a, a, a woman here, you say that protector. I don't need your protector. I just, <laughs> you know, and it's like, like I don't mean no ill intent from it. You know? It's true. Yeah. yeah. I just, I got your back, you know, or I'm here for mm. you. I hold you here for me yeah. type of thing. Yeah. So a different mm, mm. thing. And then different cultures and different regions of the country in America have their own ideal of what a spouse should be. You know, mm -hmm. so and I see that a lot of times, you know, you'll see someone marry someone from the West Coast in California and go to the South in the state like Alabama and they marry each other. And oh, well, my mom taught me to do this. My dad taught me to do this. And then yep. it's feud in the home. And then because no one know how to, you know, um, regulate their emotions or even understand their emotions to know, mm -hmm. am I really you know, to know, am I mad or am I actually sad? Mm -hmm. but I, That's I, very I, true. I yeah. And next thing yeah. you know, mm. something is happening. One thing go, leads to another. It goes too far. Police knocking at your front door. And yeah. you see all of these things, you know. Um, yeah. So it's definitely, it's it's a thing. And I am a father. Uh, I have daughters. And mm. I am trying to teach mm. them that it's okay to be in your feminine energy, you yes. know. And I'm not saying that, that you know, um, it makes you weaker of a person or anything. But it, it's just simply okay, you know. Yeah. And another in 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 closing for this question, I will say this, you know, as um men, we're looked at as weak when we weak or vulnerable when we show our emotions. And that's what I think is our, our feminine side. Mm. Yep, yep. And I mm -hmm. and I do think it's slowly starting to change because yeah. we have our athletes who regularly talk about um going to see their therapist yes. or going for a self-care day you know, yeah. massage or even getting a manicure, uh, you know, so I do or even a mental health day of work, you know? Yes. <laughs> even a mental health day of work. Yes. Mm -hmm. for absol absolutely. You know, so I'd hope uh, I'm, I'm optimistic that this will continue to change. Mm -hmm. And um, I just hope to be a part of it and make a difference in this movement because it's something that definitely needs to happen. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned mm -hmm. that you're a father, Dr. Corey. So um, this question is now to Martin, because I know you're a father to four sons. Now, I've only mm -hmm. got one, and that's difficult. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've got one teenage mm -hmm. son, and that in itself is difficult as a woman mm -hmm. to know where to get the extra support and when to ask for the extra support. But um, mm -hmm. what lessons are you embedding in your sons to kind of avoid what dr corey was saying like we don't want those pressure pots to bust and we don't know what to do with the remnants but you know we need people to be able to have these tools from an early age so what lessons are you embedded in your sons to help them navigate through life yeah uh thanks thanks rihanna i, I before i answer this question though i want to just add one small thing to, yeah by uh, all means question. yeah uh so I, I belong to um, a group of mental health advocates um, that are doing a lot of work back home in Uganda. And uh, two weeks ago, we had a Twitter space conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and it was men, um, you know, talking about men issues. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. and, 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 and in that conversation, uh, the one thing that I really picked was that men need space to cry. Yes. Mm -hmm. it, it was it was a five hour Twitter space conversation. Wow. And mm. men cried. Mm. You know, yeah. from the from the first speaker um to the last speaker, men, you know, confessing how they have been battered by their wives mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they couldn't speak up about it. Yeah. Mm. And, mm. and 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 you know, someone, you know, uh makes a submission after they've listened to another person they're like oh yes. now i have the courage to speak up I there can, you go that's it yeah i, I, I can, I can mm. say this thing out i know well, i'm yeah. not going to be judged yeah right? mm. so, so so there is that and i really love the way twitter spaces operate because they, they mm. don't have like these videos we are having so people don't want you know don't, don't yeah. judge right mm. they, they really are beginning to speak up and on that on that forum we had uh, like you know um police officers um you know psychologists psychiatrists mm -hmm. who really offered professional help it's powerful uh, but, but but my main point is that men have kept these um you know 
traumatic experiences mm. themselves because of the stigma around it and it's time to speak up it's yeah time to mm -hmm. speak up. So, yeah so I, I thought i should put it out there yeah yeah mm. i agree thank you yeah thank now you. to your question mm. yeah yeah um to your mm. question yeah i do have four very wonderful sons um my, my first son is age 13 and then my last is age six so mm -hmm. i did a pretty good job very fast uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and thanks to my wonderful wife um, she is the one looking after them right now because they don't live with me they are uh, back in Uganda mm. um, but one thing that I really want to emphasize um, in response to your question is that I have tried my best to be a present father for them mm. Mm -hmm. um, I am present in their life as in active the present. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the advice I want to give, um, especially for aspiring fathers or those who are already fathers, I think I have about five or six points, uh, if you could allow me. I will allow um, you. Thank you. Now, uh, the first one is be their best friend. Mm. Uh, one thing that I've learned through relating with my sons is that they want to talk to you as their best friend, not as their father, but mm. as their best friend. So they can freely share with you what they are experiencing, uh, the pains they are having. Mm. And as long as they are comfortable that when they share with you, you discuss with them and resolve whatever it is they're dealing with, they will open up to yeah. you. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's, that's the first point. Mm, mm. the second one is be their role model mm. be that father figure that they would want to see in themselves so that they aspire mm. to be like you yeah. when they grow up right in other words the things you do not the things you say matter. yes it's right. very mm -hmm. true yeah so, so that's the second thing the third thing is inspire them Mm. Now, um, inspiring these young men uh, takes a lot of, again, what you do and not what you say necessarily. And I'll give a very personal story here. Um, so my second born um, was kind of the timid person. I don't want to speak in public, that kind of um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. person. Um, and so I thought, okay he needs a bit of support, right? Mm. So at their school, they were running uh, prefectorial uh, campaigns, you know, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. prefect team. And I kind of, you know, jokingly, you know, talked to him and said, would you consider running for a prefectorial position? Mm -hmm. And he had never considered it, but he took up the challenge. Amazing. Mm -hmm. I was shocked that... <laughs> By the next morning, he already had his campaign statement. And he's oh, like, wow. Are, are you ready to listen to it? I'm like, wow, this is, this is amazing. Yeah. And for the next two weeks, that's all he could talk about. Mm. 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 And obviously, I supported him. Um, mm. And to cut the long story short, he actually went through the campaign and scored the highest percentage of mm. any life. Amazing. Right? And, and he just loves doing it now. I, to date, I still discuss with my wife how he transformed just yes. one <laughs> small. Mm. Mm. And, and so that's the power of, you know, inspiration. Absolutely. Yeah, that's it. That's it. And, and, and he picked it up and he is now absolutely motivated. He loves what he does, right? Um, the number four. Can I just say before you move on to number four, that's such a beautiful example of the power mm -hmm. of inspiration and leadership as well. 100%, because hundred percent, yeah. If you had pigeonholed him into what you knew him to be, he wouldn't have been able to yeah. find the courage and strength and skills to yeah. be able mm -hmm. to step out of himself and alleviate mm -hmm. himself from that previous mindset yeah. that he was in so yeah. well done to you and your wife and everyone yeah. else that supported him on that journey and 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 you showing him that belief you know that you exactly. had belief in him that he could do it you, you even suggesting that he should do it 
showed him that you believed in him you know and, and you know yeah. showing him that self-belief is what kind of fueled you know inspired and fueled him to go for it so yeah that's it very, changed very, his own belief very system that's okay. it yeah yeah. but yeah continue number four and then number five <laughs> yeah thank you uh so number four um and this is um my personal favorite is teach them about money mm. um one of the things mm. one of the challenges i faced earlier on as 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 a dad was that you know you have all these requests daddy buy for me this daddy buy for me this toy daddy buy for me this um <laughs> PS4, this and that, mm, right? Yeah, yeah. I, and I struggled as a dad trying to fulfill those those needs, those mm, requirements. Mm. Because you know, you want to be a good dad, you want to be there, give them what they want, right? Mm. Um, then I realized that there is a better way to do it, and uh, and so I started a small project for them, where mm. I mm. I would pay them for the work that they do, right? Mm -hmm. I would yeah. reward them. So ordinarily, think house chores like you know washing your car, uh, mm -hmm. doing dishes, you know, um, yeah. mowing the lawn, things that mm -hmm. ordinarily you would pay for, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would encourage them to do those tasks, and I would pay them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then they would save that money, right? Mm -hmm. So I would tell them, okay, fine. If you need to buy a toy, you need. To save up right mm. so they would actually work knowing that they want to buy that toy and they would save up and they would have a target then they would come to you and say that i want to wash your car right mm. I'm like, okay go ahead wash it and then i'd pay them uh so mm. over time it has really worked so everyone has their own bank account and they are actively monitoring how much money is there they'll be asking me how much money is there that, right mm. uh, and so that's something that i would uh, encourage other parents to do as well yeah um, absolutely number five is to teach them respect um mm -hmm. respect for themselves but also respect for others yeah um mm -hmm. but, but more importantly and this is very very important is teaching these boys to respect women because mm -hmm. yes uh, and, and and this comes from how you treat your own woman so how i talk mm -hmm. to my wife how i treat my wife how i you know we might we might have arguments right mm -hmm. it happens. but we don't have those arguments in front of the boys mm -hmm. we, we 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 go to our space where we have our arguments and then and then we resolve them there so they grow up knowing that as a man you have to treat your wife in this way you mm -hmm. have to a woman with respect and so you have to treat everyone else with respect another quick example is our driving manners let's say on the road <laughs> you know do you scream at the person who scratches your car you know do you use swear you know those swearing words again all those for me teach your your, your sons how better to deal with society mm -hmm. um, with respect you know um so that's that's the, the the number five and then there's a bonus that i want to throw in there <laughs> <laughs> and that is teaching your boys that grades are important but skills are more important mm, so absolutely i am one person who believes that grades are important but skills are more important than grades Mm, mm. And, and so I do not hound my, my, my son for not getting 98%. I encourage him to get 98%, 99%. Yeah. But I acknowledge that if he doesn't get 98%, it's probably because he has his interest in something else. Mm. And I encourage him and support him to pursue that. So it's important, yes, to encourage them that, you know, do well in school, but it's also more important uh, to, to tell them uh, that, you know, it's what you do with what you know that matters, not just what you know. I agree. Yeah. I agree. And thank you for the bonus as well, because I think that one's definitely so important because it can really build a misunderstanding between 
um, practical skills, technical skills and intellect. And uh, I'm a big believer in putting theory to knowledge. You can go and read all the books, get all the qualifications in the world, but it's how you apply it to real life and real worlds that counts. And particularly from young ages where you're instilling this, this is all part and parcel of their identity development. So, Dr. Corey, um, mm-hmm. in your opinion, where do you think some of the the jaded identity um, development can come from if people aren't instilling these types of knowledge and practices in their children? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, first, I want to say that I know in America, a lot of these programs, right, like, um, like if you're in school and you got wood shop, and you mm. got culinary or cosmetology. Those programs are seen to have gone away in public schools. And people mm. say it's due to funding or a lack of funding. Um, and a lot okay. of kids seem to have challenges with the academics. And I try to tell people exactly like you said, Martin, it's okay. Everybody not going to be a straight A student. Yeah. <laughs> and, and to get tell, and you know, and to push the, you have to get great grades, you have to go to college. And that, that is, that's the, that looks, that's what success looks like for some, but not for mm. all. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. There's mechanics that make amazing money, mm-hmm. you know, and without school loan debt, I want to add to, you know, <laughs> so there's different <laughs> ways. But um, definitely Eric Erickson, he has a, a the psychological developmental theory and he has yes. eight different stages. Yes. And in those eight stages, there's two that I find more significant probably than the others. And mm-hmm. the, the first one is the fourth stage. And that's around the five years old to 12 year old mark. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, industry versus uh, in, in feeling feelings of infer- uh, being inferior yes. and what that is that's the time where we kind of discover and realize that we're different than everyone else right mm. that's when we when we but when it's important for us to have that positive recognition because it, it kind of it breeds us to be hard working right we get that positive mm. feedback versus when we're getting negative feedback at that time it kind of kills our our motivation Right. Our, mm. our, we have a lack of motivation because everything we do seems to be so wrong, you know, and that's why I highly encourage parents to um, to not be as hard on them as kids. Your kid, your son, come, son come or daughter comes home with a seat. It's not the end of the world. Yeah. You know, everyone wants the honor roll student and put the bumper sticker on their car. My child <laughs> made honor roll. That is, is, you don't have to, you know, and then yeah. um, and like you said, Martin's kids excel at what they're interested in yeah right so not every kid i, I wasn't as interested in algebra either <laughs> you know mm-hmm. so <laughs> you know but i might be interested in i don't know um building air conditioning i don't know but you know i think we should fund our kids towards our passion the other mm-hmm. one though is of uh, the actually the very next one on is uh his fifth um developmental stage and that's at that age of 12 to 18 years old right and it's um identity and role confusion Mm -hmm. and this is so so important right this guy eric erickson he actually coined the phase um identity crisis and this is the stage uh development stage where that comes from because mm-hmm. it's where we are learning that um, everyone has different societal roles, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah, yeah, you know, there's parents, there's it's, uh, children, there's teachers, there's students, you know, all of these different things. And I try to encourage parents at this stage, it's important to let them kind of discover and experience what they want to be, who they mm-hmm. want to become. Because a lot of times, this is where parents push their own views, mm-hmm. their own dreams or beliefs onto a, a student or, or to a, a child mm-hmm. um adolescent and this is when the child becomes uh unmotivated mm-hmm. uh he you know push their kids away and kind of feel lost and feel like a failure if they don't live up to what mom and dad said success is yeah and so much and I, I mean we see it so so much um and not only in, in academics, but we see it in sports. Um, I grew up playing sports since I was four years old. Every year of my life, I played sports until I couldn't anymore. Mm-hmm. And I honestly, um, after college, about two years removed, I went through a, a, a depression because that's all I know how to do. All mm-hmm. I know how to do in my whole life was play sports. So I felt like a failure when that career couldn't continue. And then yeah. the in the fail, um, the American football and the American football. They do a great job of trying to find um, careers for retired athletes because mm-hmm. a lot of them, once it's all over, they don't know what to do. Yeah. You know? um, and so rows of dep- um, feelings of depression and things like that. 
uh, it starts to form as well. So it's definitely important, though, those two, um, I would say, is the uh, the industry versus feelings of inferiority. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and being feeling inferior and identity and role confusion. Those are probably the two biggest ones. Thank you for the knowledge, Dr. Corey. <laughs> Honestly, and it's, it's, it's so interesting to know that it's not just like, you know, sometimes when you see these things happening, it's like, okay, it's not all in my head. This is actually happening. And right. where you've mentioned about the repeal of funding for um, like industry, like practical skills, I find it's somewhat, a reverse over here because I was the the girl that was in like DT and um, woodshop as you'd call it in America mm. I was in the catering mm. class I was a, that practical person I wasn't book savvy I really really wasn't it it really was a difficult phase for me but I know Dennis like personally we've known each other for a very long time he'd call me a bookworm you know but I've had mm. to really work at that you know um and I find mm. that just having the the interplay between um academia, creativity, um, and passion really can drive someone forward. So I'm gonna kind of throw out some final questions for you all, because this has been a really lucrative and beautiful discussion. But I just wanna ask from your perspective, um, there's been a lot of public health initiatives and agendas around uh, men's health, whether it be physical or mental, like a couple of weeks ago, we just had men's, uh, yeah, men's um, health month. Um, mm -hmm. but in your opinion, and this is to anyone that wants to answer, um, what works well and what is missing? Yeah. What do we need? Um, I think I'll go back to j just what you just touched on and what uh, Dr. Corey touched on in regards to a lot of um, lessons being taken out of schools. So Dr. Umar Johnson kind of touches on that a lot, you know, in that a lot of practical courses being taken out of schools like you said auto shop you know um the carpentry and all of this uh that will enable and if you went back to say if you go back to this before you know civil rights era in the or in the 60s and 70s you know even before that um there were a lot of black men um earning really good money mm -hmm. you know from being you know being a carpenter being a le yeah. an electrician a mechanic or an engineer and no, because not everybody is necessarily academic. Uh, but once again, it's just that the agenda to kind of funnel everyone down the same kind of path. Yeah. And those that don't fall in or don't align with that feel marginalized and then end up doing other things, you know, end up, Absolutely. you know, end up on the streets or doing this, that and the other to, to make ends meet or to earn a decent living. They feel that the only way that they can earn a decent living is by possibly doing something that's... Uh, <clears throat> you know not very savory uh because those options are taken yeah because those options are taken off the table for them yeah. you know and um uh one of the businesses uh that my family is involved in is property maintenance and you know construction and things like that and you see how much uh money these builders you know uh guys that work in construction make it's crazy you know construction yes. makes the world go round but um it is not glorified you know yeah. in society or even in the community i remember growing up and looking at builders and painter decorators and i'm thinking man that, that's what you do when you got no other options <laughs> right <laughs> you're going to construction you know when you know when all else fails you're going you know you go and work construction or you go and do this that and the other yet um a lot of the you know the richest you know richest people in the world are you know come you know come from that background you know mm -hmm. so it's interesting the agenda like i said i'm you know i'm a bit of a conspiracy well they call it conspiracy theorists <laughs> but i like to to read between the lines and see what's really sometimes it's the I'm truth like, yep it is what it is yep say what you <laughs> yeah mean. it is what it is <laughs> you know and what's really happening so when you when you look at the black community uh a lot of black men have had um a lot of things taken away um mm from them in terms of what they can do so their options have been limited and then you've got the media and society pushing this image of what a, a man should be and what success uh -huh. is and in mm -hmm. this that and the other through the media through music through film and you know and so you know a lot of black men feel that if they 
aren't doing this or making this amount of money and this, that, and the other. They're failures. And then the same thing's been pushed to the women. You know, if your man right. ain't doing this for you, if he ain't doing that for you and this, that, and the other. So it's Absolutely. almost like what you get happening in society is like the disempowerment of men. Um, yeah. And then you're getting the empowerment of women, which is causing that imbalance and that divide yeah. and breaking up families is cra yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's crazy. Absolutely. It's crazy. Earlier, we mentioned Black Lives Matter you know blm mm -hmm. and um when you look at black lives matter i read their man manifesto i read the black lives matter manifesto there was nothing in there for straight black men <laughs> nothing <laughs> there was nothing in it for black men you know it's mm -hmm. it's, 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 a, it's a foundation an organization that's you know that was uh, uh run by three sisters you know mm -hmm. <laughs> uh but there was you know there was something in there for every you know lgbtq plus nothing yeah. in there for straight men you know mm -hmm. uh, there's something there for straight females nothing in there for straight men so you're thinking why you know so there's yeah. got to be an agenda there somewhere yes yeah. but um kind of going on to um and that's what i'm saying it's just recognizing and seeing exactly what's up you know mm -hmm. you know catching the play recognizing the play you know corey so you, you come from a sporting background <laughs> so mm -hmm. you know in, in you know in, in american football um every team has 50 different plays <laughs> that they have mm -hmm. to memorize every quarterback has to memorize 50 different plays you know so once you know if you clock what the other team's play is trying to do you're then you then put yourself in a position where you can you can maneuver to you can outmaneuver them uh, absolutely or you can you know so yeah it's, it's just uh and a lot of what we do at manhood academy is just letting the boys that we uh, work with just making them aware <laughs> You know, just be aware of what's happening. You know, you don't have to react to it. You just be aware of what's mm. really happening and where certain traps are being set for you, you know, mm. to kind of react in a certain way, you know, and this, that, and the other. So just be aware of that so you can kind of maneuver. Once again, it's about it's about maneuvering, you know, a it certain is. kind of it's that terrain, you know, maneuvering that terrain and you know, and um having the the knowledge the information and the wisdom to do that and having the support to be able to do that and knowing when to um uh you know the young people over here use uh the phrase drawn out you know when mm. you get drawn out when you get uh um yeah getting drawn out or being um uh, what's the word i'm looking for um uh no it's it's, it's, it's gone but yeah just being drawn out and being uh you know pulled out of your you know pulled out of your center you know by somebody else mm. you know so just recognizing the game um mm. you know and and just knowing exactly it's knowing what what your part is within that game knowing who you are ideally but knowing what part what part what your part is in that game and knowing what to do at any given point in time you yeah. know and that's basically what we try uh to equip um the young masters that we work with as much as possible you know it's all it's all about self-mastery yeah. and um like i said if you know who you are nobody else is you know if you don't know who you are you know people will tell you who you are you know so right yeah yeah, yeah, so, yeah so yeah so sorry i kind of went off on a little bit no it's time. okay i was just trying to kind of holistically give a a self-mastery yeah. and the centralization of black men's voices is what's missing from public mm. health agendas that's yeah. what i've heard from mm. what you've said um mm -hmm. i might yeah it's, it on, yeah on. it's missing for yeah it's it's missing from public health agendas mainly because <laughs> we got to look at the system and um in the 90s the early 90s late 80s early 90s the phrase institutional racism mm. you know started coming up a lot Mm -hmm. you know um i remember being at university when i first heard the phrase institutionalized racism and i kind of understood it you know it's um uh, and to me it was almost like uh prejudices and racism that's kind of inbuilt or built right within it right into that the a fabric of a particular society mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know when the very foundations of western society were being laid and created you know black people as you know black people as a people you know they weren't being laid for us mm -hmm. <laughs> you know right, these right. things weren't being laid down for us so why are you then surprised that the system does not work you know is not working in your favor you know the yeah. system wasn't created for you it wasn't Absolutely. created by you it wasn't created <laughs> by you it wasn't created for you <laughs> yeah so why are you even surprised you know and so 
like I said, what we work a lot to do is to switch uh, young black men onto this, but not to make them paranoid or to make them, you know, give them a victim mentality, but just to show them, just know the game that you're playing, you know, yeah. know the game that know what know what you're up against. So then that way, you know exactly how to maneuver. But it starts with doing that. Otherwise, you try, uh, try as you, you know, you might, um, or that you try different things and become frustrated and not understand why things aren't working out for you. So yeah. it's that, you know, it's uh, things are set against us in a certain way. It doesn't mean that we can't succeed and we can't overcome, but yeah. understand, you know, understand where you're, you know, you're standing to begin with, I understand where your, you know, what your starting point is, so that way you kind of know exactly how to plot your route. Mm. You know, thank you, forward. Dennis. Much Absolutely. appreciated. Yep. Um, anyone I, else, Doctor Corey Martin? Can I come in? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. Of course. To, yeah. Yeah. Go. Come in and 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 uh, add on to what Dennis just mentioned. Um, mm. I think a lot of what we see um, is is really tied to our education system. Um, mm. Personally, uh, looking back at you know um, where I come from and what we have been taught in schools is you know for you to be successful you need to be a lawyer you need to be an engineer you need to be um, mm. this you know hot shot. you need to be an accountant you need to be a doctor yeah, absolutely absolutely, a... absolutely mm. right um, and at the height of it you need to be a professor but but mm. looking uh, seriously about it it's not about that right. Mm. It's not about that because you can be as successful even when you don't do any of those. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, in my organization, I have a very brilliant young man. Um, he has not done even university. But mm -hmm. the kind of amazing work that he does has mm -hmm. been from his experience. Yes, sir. Yeah. He, the, the, the people that mm. have masters, the people that have um, you know all mm. these degrees, don't do as good a job as he does, mm. because he has used his experience and he has also used his um, adaptability, you know, to the different circumstances to actually mm. understand that to do a good job, this is what mm -hmm. you need to do. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so we don't need to go in a lecture room to learn some of these things. Yes, we need that mm -hmm. knowledge, but how do we use that knowledge? Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. um, I want to bring that quickly to the experience here in Sydney because when I moved down to Sydney, one of the yeah. first things that that I noticed was that um, the so-called blue-collar jobs mm. are actually yeah. more treasured here than the white-collar jobs. Okay. That's it. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, mm -hmm. so, so uh, the guys that work in the in the in the in the construction industry, the bricklayers, mm -hmm. the guys that do the ele electrical installation, the guys that mm. do, um, uh, you know, the plumbing work, they mm. are mm. the most sought out, after, you know, because mm -hmm. the, 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 their work is is highly valued, right? Mm. And it's highly paid. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you have a problem with your lock and you need to fix it, before you call, you know, uh, the, the guy that does that, you need one hundred and fifty dollars minimum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Call out charge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the white collar jobs don't have that kind of um, uh, assurance, right? So the guys who drive mm -hmm. the most expensive cars on Sydney roads are actually the guys that do that kind of work. Mm. That's it. No, no, uh, yeah, no, that's yeah. what the experience. <laughs> that was experience. And they have the most freedom as well. You know, the Absolutely. most job satisfaction. The most job Absolutely. satisfaction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because they work within their time, within their means, and and they do an that's amazing it. job. Mm. Now, those of us who are into this white collar jobs, working eight to five, yes, we earn mm. a decent amount, but because mm. of the kind of environment in which we work, and you know, we we end up more stressed. Right, yeah. that's it, and we don't enjoy the, 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 the work itself. So, high so this whole rate. notion, yeah, yeah, very this high. Whole yeah. Notion that, uh, for you to be successful, you have to you know, do this amazing course and be an engineer, an accountant. Mm -hmm. I'm an accountant. I, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's 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 a fallacy, and that mm -hmm. that needs to be demystified. A hundred percent, hundred percent. And, mm. and young men and young women need to be told that you can be the best at what you do as long as you follow your passion and still be 100%. very, very successful. Yeah. A hundred percent. It depends Absolutely. on your natural, yeah, it depends yeah. on your natural giftings. And as uh, I have two daughters, 
Um, my eldest daughter is 24 and the young, her younger sister is 18. Mm. And, um, and even in what I do as a personal trainer and, and you know, and, and body transformation coach and things like that is trying to, you know, gauge what people's natural giftings are, what their natural talents are, mm. you know, what is it that you're naturally good at? You know, what's the mm. one thing that you could get up and do every single day of the week yeah. and never get bored and never, you know, and, you know, you enjoy it and, you know, and things like that. And how can you get someone to pay you to do that? You know, what's your, you know, what you, what do you find yourself gravitating towards? And, okay, cool. Can you find out a way that you can create a career out of that? And that's, yeah. and, and I've helped clients that I'm working with, you know, uh, change jobs and change careers and leave certain relationships. And it's crazy. So, and I do the same thing because my two daughters are very different. My, my eldest daughter is very, you know, she's, she's quite intellectual. Uh, she was very academic and, you know, a thinker. And my, my younger daughter is very, you know, she's very practical. You know, mm. she's a lot more vocational, a lot more practical, but you know, she's, yeah. she, you know, but she's a go-getter. I see that about her as well. She's quite bold and, mm. you know, so I, I don't try and compare the two of them. You know, I try, yeah. and, you know, this is your strength, you know, this is your area of strength and go for that. You know, this is your area of strength and go for that. And, you know, mm. go crazy. But also the other thing that we need to remind ourselves is when you look back in African history, when you look back at black history and African history, we were master architects and master builders. Absolutely. Mm. <laughs> you know, so it's not it's not your doctors and it's not your professors and your accountants that built the you know yeah. build the build our society. And, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. and built our society and all these great things and and taught the West how to you know, you know, talk the West about plumbing and, you mm. know, and irrigation and all of these things, you know, mm. these were highly skilled master builders and master masons that did this. And that's where, you know, that's where we stem. Some of the greatest cities in, in you know, in Africa, you're going back to Timbuktu and Mali and yeah. all of this. Yeah. This is before you yeah. even come to Egypt and Memphis and all mm -hmm. the, you yeah. know, and, and the pyramids and all, you know, all of these structures across, not just in Africa, but right across the planet. Mm -hmm. you know that were constructed by you know by black people you know these mm -hmm. were very skilled and highly highly skilled uh, uh, you know people you know people with their hands you know it took mm -hmm. a lot of skill to be able to do that don't get me wrong you had the architects you had the you know the yeah the accountants because everything has a budget and this that and the other how what's the manpower do we need and this that and the other but these weren't the jobs that were just coveted and you know made more important right. than other jobs you know yeah and you see it in western society now where you know the guy that cleans the rubbish on the streets doesn't get anywhere near as much as you know um the doctor or the nurses who are doing in the hospitals who are doing a practical work or one-to-one -one with the patients and you know calming patients and reassuring patients get paid less than a doctor who just comes and you know spends five Sign minutes it. with this patient right yeah signs this and gets out of there and you mm. think to yourself it just does not make sense you know <laughs> so uh so let me realize, let me ask you i'm gonna cut in here hmm. sorry um sure, let me sure. ask you so what what education is needed for us as communities to mm -hmm. improve these outcomes these psychosocial outcomes for black men across africa across the caribbean black british mm -hmm. men and black um african-american men how can we improve our education on what is needed for us to be not only sustainable but improve um and utilize our experience mm. I'd say I'll, I'll go back to knowledge of self. So, sorry to cut you. Uh, oh, no, no. Go I, ahead. Go I, ahead. Yeah. I say I'll go back to knowledge of self. Know who you are first. You know, mm. know who you are and know the situation that you're in. Mm. And based on the situation that you're in as a people, what do you need? Mm. You know, mm. if you don't know the situation that you're in, you, you're not going to know what you're going to need to go forward. OK, yeah. cool. As a people, as a, as a community to move forward, what are we going to need? Do we need more lawyers? Do we need more teachers? Do we need more accountants? Do we need mm. builders? What is it that we need based on the situation that we're in? And that that way we'll know exactly what area to educate ourselves in and what area to really focus in, mm. you know, in order to kind of lift us up out, out of where we are and forge forward. But for me, um, self-identity, you know, um, is top of that agenda and top of that scale in regards to helping with your self-esteem self-confidence and this that and yeah. the other which then fuels you put forging ahead and 
you know, going for these careers and pushing through in these different, um, you know, areas. But I think it's, it starts with, yeah, knowledge of self, you know, know yourself Wonderful. first and then you know where to go from there. Thank but you're you. going, Dr. Cora. So. Yes. Oh, no, please, oh, no, no worries. I was just mm. going to, and, and everything he said, you said that all beautifully, um, Dennis, because I completely agree. I also think that it's important for us to realize that education is not a sheet of paper. Yes. Right. This reason, like, <laughs> we don't need to graduate. Um, like, I, like the the guy that Eric Erickson that developed the psycho, um, psychosocial developmental theory. He yeah, yeah, yeah. 10, He did no college degree, mm -hmm. none. But yep. his work is still significant today. You know, yeah. even from a, mm. like an Albert Einstein, and I believe this is an mm. Albert Einstein quote when he says that mm. um. Everyone's a genius, but if you judge a fish by his ability to yeah, climb a ability tree, to climb a tree, tree. Yeah, he will yeah. go his entire life believing he's stupid. <laughs> it's that a is failure. Hope. Yeah. Yes, and that is the truth. You know, we yeah. all have our own things. I yeah. definitely think we need to get back to the the skills. Um, yeah. I believe, like you said, Martin, um, education is important. But if you if you can't mobilize education, if you can't put it to work, then what use is it? You know. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I definitely think that is the way. And also just more people like us who's willing to speak up. I think that a lot of yes. people in our world, they get in trouble, quote, so to speak, or they have some type of consequence, negative consequence, for saying too much. Mm -hmm. But what about people that say too little? Yeah. Those yeah. are the people that should be have some consequences. Like, so yeah. we have to speak up. You know, we yeah. have to stand up, speak <laughs> up, be examples, you know. Yeah. And like you said, Dennis, the system, the, the structure wasn't built for us. So if we don't start building our own systems and structures and inviting that's our it. youth in, then nothing's going to change. So mm -hmm. that's what I what I think needs to happen. Thank you, mm -hmm. Dr. Corey. And Martin, mm -hmm. last but not least, what do you think yes. is required yes. or education is required for us? Yeah, I actually just want to pick it up from what Dr. Corey just said um, and, and just give you a few examples. Look at mm -hmm. the, the founders of Google. Um, I mean, no college degree. Look at mm -hmm. you know, the late um, uh, Steve Jobs, no college mm -hmm. degree. Mm -hmm. um, right. So if, if you actually look at the, the richest men and women in the world, mm -hmm. it's not the college degree that actually, right. you know, uh, put them there. Um, if mm. you look at the, 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 the you know, a list of all the professors that we know across the world, uh, you, you would struggle to find one who is, you know, uh, wealthy, I, I, I should say. Mm. And mm -hmm. why, why is that, right? So it's yeah. really not, you know, you know it's, it's the, not the knowledge that you, you have in your head that matters. It is how you mm. use the knowledge that you have. That knowledge, that yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mm. And I'll just share this personal experience. I am in my final, final year of my of my PhD and I'm thinking about submitting my thesis. But I was just having a chat with my brother the other day and I was telling him, by the way, uh, all the knowledge that I needed in my PhD program, I already have it. So even if I don't submit and get the paper, I have everything that yeah. I need. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And so you better submit not, it though. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. <laughs> you didn't spend all that time writing it. Submit it. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I, I, mm. I definitely do that. Um, so, but my, my point is that um, mm. ultimately, what matters is how you use the knowledge that, mm -hmm. that you, that you have. have. Mm -hmm. and, 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 um, and, and maybe one last thing that I want to say, which is connected to what Dennis was saying, is that. Um, these days, uh, employers are looking more for, you know, employees, and I want to just focus on mm -hmm. that, who are emotionally mm -hmm. intelligent. Yes. Yeah. Emotionally mm -hmm. intelligent. And, and there's now another mm -hmm. another aspect actually that is coming up, which is social intelligence. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they are moving away from this, you know, the, the common I, IQ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and moving more on social intelligence and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, emotional intelligence. Why? Because a lot of work that we do now requires those two skill sets yes. rather mm -hmm. than, you know, the, the, the how much, you know, the crumb work that we are, we are used to and, you know, and yeah, put all yeah. that stuff there, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. how can you withstand, you know, societal challenges? How do you deal with mm -hmm. a difficult boss? How do you deal with a difficult mm -hmm. colleague? How do you yeah. deal with a difficult mm -hmm. customer? Those are the skills mm. that we need. 
Uh, and so yeah. if our education system can be fine-tuned to incorporate some of those things, I mm -hmm. think we go a great way in dealing with some of these issues. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I completely agree. Yeah, um, just to, just to, I know yeah, we, you um, can throw in your last comment. It, just to throw <laughs> in my last comment. Um, I said Western, the Western educational system, like I said, it's a program, you know, it's mm -hmm. a program. The programs that you think in a certain way, uh, programs you to be more analytical um, and less practical. Um, it will teach you to be able to find more problems, um, to be able to find problems more than you can find solutions for problems. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very, yeah. you know, analytical in nature. But we need to also understand as black people that the way that we're taught now, the Western education isn't how we were educated before. You know, yeah. uh, if you go back to thousands of years ago, even hundreds of years ago in the village, all the children were educated by elders, you know, wise people. Yeah. These were teachers. Exactly. These were people that yeah. were naturally gifted to be teachers. These were the people that were elected to be teachers, not the person that did the did has done a teaching degree and has got the best qualification. These were people that were just innately gifted at teaching and being able to, you know, pass on knowledge and stories and this, that and the other. And these were the people that, you know, the children sat around and sat at the feet of and learned. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and then so and so on and so forth. Um, going back to that, also when it came to the way that we write, wrote, and the way that we assimilated information and took on information, we used to write in hieroglyphics or hieroglyphs or characters. We didn't write in single words and the alphabet that we use. So mm -hmm. you've probably seen um, um, even movies or documentaries where an archaeologist or someone goes into a a, a cave or a tomb and there's hieroglyphs on the walls and yeah. they they read num first of all they read from right to left not left to right mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know and they're able to almost read the equivalent you know information of the equivalent of a thousand page book yeah mm -hmm. on one wall you know because they're reading symbols and interpreting yeah. those symbols and therefore yeah. able to you know take in that knowledge so the way that we read and the way that we write and the way that we uh, learn has been slowed down number one because we are because of the alphabet the english alphabet or the you know the roman alphabet and mm -hmm. also by being forced and taught to read from right to uh, left to right as opposed to right to left if you look mm -hmm. at certain cultures some of the most intelligent cultures yeah they read from right to left arabic is read from right to left uh, Japanese, right to left, you know, um, the Chinese, who are some of the smartest people on the planet, use characters, you know, that mm -hmm. way they're able to ingest information really quickly and interpret information really quickly because everything mm -hmm. is in characters and this, that and the other. Whereas mm -hmm. in the, you know, people in the West or people that are stuck on, um, you, know, Ro you know, the Roman kind of, uh, you know, information, you know, learning and this, that and the other are still trying to spell words and Mm -hmm. you know this that and the other and he's taking you like i said you write a thesis you know you, how, mm -hmm. how many words is your uh, thesis um martin <laughs> um about 280 pages pages wow. okay yeah look pages. at that yeah and how long is it going to take you to type those words how long is it going to take someone to read God. that information and then ingest that information you hear the saying if you want to hide something from a black man put it in the book you write yeah. it down but yep. yeah but i i but yeah. but see I, I kind of got the reason, you know, things are hidden in books because a lot of black people innately struggle with and you know and struggle with reading and writing the English way. Mm. Yeah, you you hear a lot of young black boys and young people ha having dyslexia or mm -hmm. not being able mm -hmm. to, you know, because that is the that's not the natural way it's that we're natural. supposed to. Yeah. It's not and natural I, to us. I think so a lot of that us goes... are still fighting against it and resisting it. Yeah. You know? A lot of that but is you... head down <laughs> to cultural proficiency and your cultural yeah, understanding, know. but also a cultural mm -hmm. humility because you can learn a lot from different cultures and the way that they do 100%. things. And that is 100%. a way that we are able to break this cycle. Um, I mm -hmm. really do feel that we are able to. So I'm sorry to cut you in there. I could speak to you all, no. all night. Oh, all all night. night. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to yeah. ask you all to leave um, our viewers and listeners with ways they can get in touch with you to deepen these mm -hmm. discussions um, should they want to get yes. in touch with you all. Um, so I'm going to ask Dr. Corey, how can people get in touch with you? What's your next upcoming projects? 
Right, that's why I'm trying to pull up the name of my Twitter handle. <laughs> All right. Um, the way you anyone can get in contact with me and further these discussions is by finding me on Twitter. And my Twitter handle is at Beanstock, B-E-A-N-Z, Stock, S-T-O-C-K. And um, my next project, I'm actually in the middle of starting a podcast with me and a few friends from back home in California. And on there, we're going to be talking about everything from mental health to sports to relationships to brotherhood, Amazing. all type of things. And I look forward to, you know, collaborating with all of you guys in the near future as well. Um, mm -hmm. I about collaboration. That's all it's about, you know. Um, it's an old African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Mm -hmm. go so together. I definitely think we, mm -hmm. that's something that we got to do. So that's Absolutely. where you guys can find me. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Corey. Uh, Dennis, okay. where can people find you? What's your upcoming All project? Right. All right. People can find me on Instagram. Uh, my Instagram handle is at the gym guy PT. Yeah, yeah. If you search at the gym guy, as soon as you start typing in the gym guy, I will come up. Yep, you um, definitely so will. people can find me. Yeah. But, um, now, uh, where can be uh, my next project? Um, so I'm working see we're constantly doing projects with manhood academy global um i'm one of my next projects in the next few months um i'm working on relocating or going back to uganda me and my queen yeah. are working on going back to uganda um i want to set up business over there but one thing that i want to do is uh, we want to do is um uh, build orphanages uh hospitals uh schools yeah. help to repair roads um uh, running water electricity mm. or just even support already existing orphanages and schools and you know kind of basically use the the information and the knowledge that i've gathered over the 30 plus years of living in the U, um in the west and use that take that back home to build where we come from mm. you know there's there's a lot of young black people that lose their lives um every day trying to escape africa to come to the west and this that and the other because they feel that there's no options back home. So it's to, you know, it's creating those options yeah. back home so that our people don't feel that they need to leave where they are and go somewhere else and go to a foreign land and give the best years of their life and you know, mm -hmm. you know, to to, to to a community and a society that doesn't appreciate them. You yeah. know, so so for me it's all about rebuilding, you know, it's you know, going following on from what Marcus Garvey started in the nineteen twenties and you know, and things like that and just yeah, just it's going back home, you know. Amazing. Uh, leaving leaving these shows and going back home and developing that so yeah uh yeah so one last thing another thing that we use at manhood academy as well is especially when it comes to men um there's a saying that goes heal the boy and the man will appear right heal the boy and the man will appear so um yeah so um we'll get, <laughs> we'll get to healing we're getting to healing Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dennis. And who knows, there could be scope for collaboration between yourself and Martin as a fellow Ugandan. <laughs> Even Corey, yes, yes everyone. Listen, well, yes. Let's, let's, listen, let's use everything that we have. There's a reason why. There's a reason why some of us were born in the West. There's a reason why some of yeah. us traveled yeah. to the West and lived in the West. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, the, listen, you know, people lived, the white man lived amongst black people, you know, studied us for centuries and centuries, mm. you, know? <laughs> you know. So there's a reason why we have found ourselves where we are and we have knowledge and information that our people and our community need really badly so yeah. um utilizing that part this knowledge yeah, yeah let's utilize that knowledge like martin was saying knowledge alone is nothing unless yeah, uh, we put it into practice amazing Absolutely. and martin where can people find you and what are your upcoming projects well um i think i will also give you my uh social media handles so um my personal social media handles uh i'm on twitter i'm on instagram and i'm on linkedin all at m bakundana m b a k u n d a n a on linkedin Wonderful. on twitter and on instagram uh but you can also reach okay. me on uh my organizational handle uh, at lem mindfulness so that's that's my organization Mm -hmm. um, and um, we've been doing amazing work. The whole of this week, we've been at a university back home in Uganda talking to young people. I think more than 10,000 young people that we've been speaking mm. to about mental health. Mm. And the response we are getting is amazing. It, it's, it's just that personal, I'm not there physically, you know, to be there and talk to them, but you know, the 
response we are getting is amazing. Mm. Um, tomorrow morning, uh, which is uh, for me a couple of hours away for uh, uh, because already <laughs> it's morning for me. <laughs> um, um, I'm hosting a, a Twitter space, uh, and we, we are going to be discussing some of these issues. Um, Amazing. Uh, I'm going to be hosting uh, some some um, um, prominent Ugandans, and they're going to be telling us about you know their life story and how they have navigated different challenges that um, you know from very humble beginnings to the, 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 the achievements that they have made. So it's it's it's. A space that I'm going to be hosting in the next couple of hours, um, and it's it's going to be massive. Um, uh, and then, lastly, what I want to say is that um, at my organization, we 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 focus on three things: um, love, empathy, and mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And why we focus on those three things is because one you know if you are to be able to give love you have to first love yourself there are mm -hmm. many people in this world who don't have self-love mm -hmm. so so we really preach self-love and then love for the community right you know okay. uh, so that's the first thing the second thing is empathy and, and why we focus on empathy is because we are all going through different challenges uh, mm -hmm. but we know we get judged before we are understood mm -hmm. so what we are mm -hmm. preaching is mm -hmm. let us first be understood before we can actually uh you know uh judge others and then the last one is mindfulness of course uh, i'm sure all of you understand what mindfulness is but um the, the focus for, for that is that we encourage people to live in the present moment mm. acknowledging the past challenges that we have gone through and also acknowledging that the future has its worries but there's no point in worrying about the future mm. rather we focus on what we can control and that is the present amazing so so that, that's what we advocate mm. for as an organization and i would uh, encourage all of you to join us in this um journey of mm -hmm. advocacy on mental health but we're also doing real impactful projects on the ground and i'm i'm, yeah. I'm looking forward to working with you dennis when you come on the ground <laughs> uh, and dr corey as well um, i'll probably be reaching out to you as well because we are really um trying as much as to spread this message Thank amazing so amazing and thank yeah. you all for your dedication to not only the work that you do with young people your advocacy for black lives um but also mm. the activism because it is exactly that you mm. are all active in what you're doing um so yeah. thank you all and it's been an amazing conversation. I could Pleasure. literally speak to you for hours. So um, whoever's listening, Pleasure. whatever country you are in, whatever time it is, thank you for listening. This is Rihanna mm. from Black Mental Health Matters, along with Martin, Dr. Corey, and Dennis, wishing you a beautiful and blessed day. Take care. Goodbye. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Bye. All right. Bye.